Howdy everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger, mathematician turned banker. In this series, I'm trying to get you to understand how the modern banking system has evolved and some of the important issues that we all need to be aware of about modern banking. And I'm telling it through the story, my development as a Wild West banker starting from 1850 in Little Cactus out west and proceeding into very interesting modern times. So today we're going to talk about debts, bonds, and defaults. Very important concepts in the modern financial world. Now we've talked about money, that money largely can be divided into coin, which always means silver and gold mostly, cash, and credit. The modern evolution of money naturally kind of goes in this direction. In the early days, like when I started, silver and gold were all important. And then gradually cash was more and more introduced and eventually became the dominant form of currencies. And then today we are now moving more towards a credit system. So it's natural to think about credit as being somehow the more modern version of money. But actually it's interesting that in some sense, the actual reality is reversed. Now, in modern economics textbooks, the origins of our monetary system are usually described in terms of an evolution from earlier barter systems. But researchers have found it very difficult to actually substantiate that claim. And about 100 years ago, anthropologists started thinking about this, and they realized that the story was actually quite different. That the origins of our financial system really are in innate human biological tendencies. Human beings have a natural capacity for dealing with credit systems long before any kinds of currencies were involved. This has to do with our inclination to keep track of favors and obligations and a feeling of reciprocation that we want to balance the books so to speak if i've done you a favor then you owe me in some sense and you're going to look for a way of reciprocating of giving me back something in exchange for what i've done you and this does not have to be a monetary thing okay it can take any kind of form to give you a good example when i first moved into little cactus and i was setting up my bank so I came from out east. I needed, of course, to build a bank, and I also needed a house for me and my family. So I had some money, and I got builders to build the bank. That was a major project. But I also built the house that we lived in, and I actually built that myself, but with the help of a lot of neighbors. So at that time, when a new person came into town and they were going to build their house, all the neighbors would come along and help. So sort of standard practice. And so for a couple of weeks, there would be lots of guys working all the time on, on my house. And of course, I had to build a nice house because I was the banker, so I had to have pretty well the best house in town. So this took quite a lot of doing. But we took great care to remember who was helping us. In fact, my, my wife ended up keeping a tally of you know, all the guys who were working and how much they actually helped me. So that later on, I would be able to reciprocate. So even years later, when I was a bank manager and busy with lots of things, I would find out about one of my friends, maybe their cousins moving into town, they need some help to build their house. I offered and I definitely volunteered to help build the house. So I would work in the mornings and then in the afternoons I would go off and spend uh, the hours in the sunshine working, which is actually quite a lot of fun. So we have this innate sense of keeping track of favors and also, well, obligations correspondingly. So there's really a, an innate notion of keeping track of credit and debt, which is then the, the basis for our monetary system. So once we do end up having some coin or cash, then we can monetize these things. So even going back to ancient times, to ancient Mesopotamia, we have cuneiform records of people 
registering debts and obligations. This tension and this balancing between credit and debt have played a huge role in the evolution of human societies. And it's important to understand you know, the big difference of being on one side of this equation or the other. Being in debt is a negative thing. Historically, being in debt is always a very negative thing to be avoided at all costs if you can. On the other hand, being a creditor, having people owe you something is something that empowers you, that gives you status, that gives you security. It's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a good thing. So there's definitely a, a moral separation here. Debt is often associated with lots of negative feelings like fear and shame and actual physical poverty and sometimes even serfdom. In ancient times, if you could not pay back a debt to a rich person, then you could expect to be forced into servitude and maybe even your family if the debt was significant enough. You could lose your land and you could also lose your liberty. And even into modern times, into the 1800s, People still were put into stocks on occasion if they couldn't pay their debts. They were thrown into prison. Okay? Being in debt was something that you avoided if you could. You only did this as an act of last sort of desperation. Of course, in modern times things have shifted and we think about debt differently, but it's important to understand that historically this has been very much a directed thing morally. This side is good. This side is bad. You want to be on this side of the equation if you can. Now, if we're friends and I do you a favor and then next week you return the favor, well, everything is balanced and it's good. And there's not really uh, an additional cost. But in the financial world, it is not so. In the financial world, there is a definite asymmetry between being a creditor and being a debtor. So aside from, of course, the exchange of money that the creditor gives the debtor some principal, and then that principal has to be returned at some later point, there are additional factors or costs involved. And these are interest and default. So let's talk about interest, which is sort of the most obvious thing. In financial terms, even going back to ancient times, if you borrowed money from someone, you could expect that they would charge you interest. Okay, this is an additional cost on top of having to return the principal, you have to return interest. So for example, if I'm a banker and you come to me for a loan, of course, I'm going to charge you interest on the money that I lend you. So this is a, a cost and it means that there's a transfer of money from debtors to creditors. Okay, it's important to understand this is a huge sort of one-way traffic that invariably if you have people who owe other people money, it's the people who owe the money who end up having to pay more, okay, because they have to pay the interest on the principal. However, it's not entirely a one-way street. It's not as if the debtor takes all of the difficulty. The creditor also needs to worry about something which is also an important part of this equation okay, and should not be forgotten. That the debtor has an other out. The other out is to abscond, to leave, to default in some fashion on the loan. In that case, the creditor ends up with a loss. So in banking, of course, this is a huge issue. That's why bankers are very careful to investigate carefully the character of the people they're lending money to or the companies. They want to look at the books of the companies. They want to look at the assets that the individuals or the companies have. And they want to determine the quality of the business plan, say, for any projects that money is being lent to. We want to minimize the possibility of default. And we have to bear the the probability of default as a, an additional cost that we have to factor in. So in some sense, the interest, at least partially, can be thought of as some kind of compensation for the possibility of default. Now the nature of these two things is so different. Interest mathematically is subtle, but it's predictable. It's 
completely understandable mathematically. There are some formulas, and I'm going to show you, you some of them, but they are a little bit tricky, but nevertheless, it's completely cut and dried ultimately. However, default is on some level very simple. Someone goes broke, or they just leave town with the money that you've lent them, or their business uh, collapses and it's all gone. So that part of it is simple, but predicting it is, is hard. Okay? It's intrinsically unpredictable and often comes as a surprise. So these are very different kinds of things that we have to face. Very mathematically clear, if a little bit subtle, and default, completely clear what's happening, but whether it's going to happen or not, and if and when, that's a big question. But a basic rule of thumb that bankers learn is that once debt gets to a certain level, the probability of default becomes very high. Okay, we have to be aware of that. So this relationship between credit and debt and this flow of interest from debtors to creditors is at the heart of almost all financial transactions. And there are some important mathematical aspects to it that have to be understood and appreciated. And if you're going to shy away from those mathematical aspects, you're not going to understand what's really going on. Okay, so come on journey here with me. We're going to develop a very important formula, probably the most important formula in the financial world. It has to do with compound interest and regular deposits. So it's a very simple story. You're going to borrow P, that's the principal, at an annual interest rate of R, which is some positive number, okay? So for example, 10%, we convert that into a decimal, that would be R equals 0.1. 5% would be R equals 0 0.05, etc. And at the end of each year, so the period of time that we're dealing with is a year, the interest rate is an annual interest rate. And at the end of the year, we're going to pay back a fixed amount D. Okay, we're going to like deposit that into the loan to reduce the loan. And we're interested in this quantity A sub N, which is the total amount owed after N years. We want to develop a formula for A sub N in terms of these inputs P, R, and D, and the number of years N. Sound good? Let's do it. So first of all, the initial condition. We're starting off at time zero, with A zero being the principal P. What about after one year? After one year, what's happened to your loan? Well, you still owe the same amount P, but now you Oh, also the additional interest on that. And the interest is R times P. So if it's a 10% interest, like I would charge you, then you'd have to multiply P by 0.1. That would be the interest that would be added on to the principal in terms of how much you owe me. And now we subtract D because you've agreed to pay at the end of this year a deposit towards decreasing the loan of D. All right, so the expression is P times 1 plus R minus D. At the start, you owed P. After one year, you owe P times 1 plus R minus D. Okay, what about after two years? Well, that's the same as what we've just done, except that instead of starting with P, we should now start with A1. So this is going to be A1 times 1 plus R minus D. In other words, we should take the A1, which is this thing here, and multiply it by 1 plus R and subtract D. So if we multiply this by 1 plus R, we get P times 1 plus R squared minus D times 1 plus R, and then we have to subtract D. So this is the expression for the amount owed after two years, A sub 2. Okay, what about A sub 3? Well, you get that by looking at the same relation, but now starting the year with a sub 2. Then you have to multiply by 1 plus r, 
and subtract d. So we have to take this thing and multiply by 1 plus r, giving us p times 1 plus r cubed, minus d times 1 plus r squared, minus d times 1 plus r, and we have to subtract another d because you're making another deposit. Okay, so can we deduce what the general term is, a sub n, after an arbitrary number of n years? Well, the, the crucial recursive relationship here that we've been using at each step is that a sub n is a sub n minus 1 times 1 plus r minus d. So that's the recursive step, and that's the initial condition. So those two things are really all that you need to be able to generate the, the sequence. Of course, on a modern spreadsheet, that makes things very simple. But of course, being mathematically inclined, we also want a formula for this. All right, so let's look at the formula. So here is the natural extension of the formulas that I've already shown you. A sub n will be p times 1 plus r to the n. And then we have a number of negatives, minus d times 1 plus r to the n minus 1, minus d times 1 plus r to the n minus 2, minus and so on, decreasing powers of 1 plus r to the very last term, minus d. So once you've seen the pattern between a1, a2, a3, you can see what's going on. You're, you've got a power of 1 plus r here to the n, which is exactly the same as this, and then the powers of 1 plus r here start with 1 less than this one, and then they decrease. So we can simplify this a little bit because all of these terms have a common factor of d, so we can bring the minus d out front, and then we can just rearrange, maybe start with this one, so that's 1, and then the next one will be 1 plus r, increasing powers of 1 plus r, so 1 plus r squared, all the way up to the highest power 1 plus r to the n minus 1. And now we're in the happy position where we can use a geometric series kind of discussion like we've talked already about when we were talking about uh, fractional reserve banking. And this is a geometric series with first term 1 and ratio 1 plus r. So its sum is given by this expression right here. It's 1 plus r to the n. That's 1 more than the highest power that appears there. Minus 1 divided by the common ratio 1 plus r minus 1. And there is an important proviso here that we have to make sure that r is not actually equal to 0. If r was equal to 0, then there's going to be a denominator of 0 here, which is no good. If r is equal to 0, then actually all of these terms are all the same and there are n of them, so actually then the formula is just n. Okay, so now we get the most important formula in banking and finance. The explicit expression for a sub n, the amount owed, if you start with principal p, annual interest rate of r, and you make annual deposits at the end of the year of d. The answer is a sub n is p times 1 plus r to the n, minus d, there's a 1 plus r to the n minus 1 in the numerator, and the denominator pleasantly just reduces to r. What a great formula. So we're going to have occasion to look at this formula um, more and in a number of different ways. But So this is our initial contact with this formula. And there's a few things to note here that it's all been algebraic. So actually, our initial assumption that r, the interest rate, was positive, that is greater than or equal to zero, is not actually really necessary. All that's necessary is for r to not be zero. But in particular, this formula would still hold even if r was, say, negative. Negative interest rates, you say. Yes, well, in my time that would have been unheard of, but in modern times, negative interest rates are quite interesting, and there's important things to say about it. And in particular, this kind of formula still applies happily. Another observation is that the sign of D is also not important. We've been talking about reducing the loan by adding deposits. If you made D negative, well, the argument would still be the same. 
and that would correspond to actually making the loan bigger by essentially withdrawing or increasing the loan by the same amount at the end of every year. That's important actually because if you just reverse that, that's really the same thing as what happens when you deposit money into an account. So instead of taking a loan out at my bank, if you deposited money into my bank, you're not going to get 10%, you can get 5%. But then the same formula essentially works if, say, you add at the end of each year a fixed amount in addition. So your money is going to grow in a certain way, and this formula is going to capture that as well. So the same formula works for a wide variety of different situations. It's a key formula in banking and finance. Okay, so I want to illustrate that formula. I want to show you what it looks like. And this is a really important exercise to generate some numbers so that we can look at these numbers explicitly and, and clearly. In fact, when I was a bank manager in Little Cactus to start with, my, uh, my accountants, when they applied for a job, I would make sure that they were able to do this. So I would actually ask them to generate by hand such tables. Okay, and we kept a book, we had a nice register. Oh, we actually had a, 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 comprehensive tables that were generated by us. Uh, that, that explained exactly what I'm showing you here. I'm just giving you a, a couple of um, examples, but uh, this is a really important exercise, first of all, to uh, strengthen arithmetic facility, and also to be able to see actually what happens dynamically over time to a loan at a fixed rate of interest with a fixed deposit. Okay, so let's consider a principle of $100. The loan is for $100. And let's suppose that the interest rate is 10% or 0.1. That's how much I would charge you in the Little Cactus Bank when I started if you came and asked me for a loan. Okay, and we're going to have a look at three possible deposit values. D equals $15. $12 and $11. So suppose, say starting here, that you agree to at the end of each year, you want to pay down this loan, you owe me $100, you're going to pay me $15 at the end of each year to diminish your loan. What's going to happen? So we start out, you owe me $100. At the end of one year, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to charge you $10 interest. So that's $110. But then you're going to pay back $15, that's the D. So you're going to end up owing me $95. Okay, and then the pattern carries on. I'm always going to charge you 10% interest. You're always going to give a deposit of $15. So your loan amount is going to reduce. And it's actually going to start reducing by more than, like here it's just more or less $5. But as the loan starts getting lower, the amount of interest that I charge you becomes lower and more of your deposit is going to reducing the principal rather than just paying the interest. So here is what happens. Um, it goes from 100 to 95 to 89.50 to 83.45 to 76.80 to 69.47 to 61.42 to 52.56 to 42.82 to 32.10 to 20.31 and that's after 10 years. And then after 11 years, I haven't got that figure, so you just subtract uh, another, probably about uh, 30, maybe you know, $7 or something left. And then in the 12th year, you actually have paid off the loan because you're still paying your $15 and you end up with $6.92 left in your account. Okay, so it's taken you 12 years this way to pay off your loan and at the end of that 12 years you can stop and you actually have a little bit of money left over. Here's the same calculation with D equals 12. So we apply the formula and you can see the numbers decreasing. They decrease at a lesser rate of course because you're paying back regularly less over here. In this situation here you can have a look at it. I'm only going down to 10. You have to keep going quite a ways up to 19. Only in 19 years do you actually end up paying off the loan and you will end up with $2.32 after you've done that. How about with $11? So now you're, most of what your 
paying is going to the interest, at least initially. Okay, it's going to take a, quite a while for it to get you know, down to a level where you're paying more towards the principal than towards your interest. So with $11 regular deposit, you can calculate it's going to take you 26 years before you finally pay off the loan, at which point you'll have $9.18 left. So this illustrates uh, a, a number of important things that even a small difference in a regular payment can have a significant effect. The difference between paying $11 a year and $12 a year is the difference between taking 26 years and taking 19 years to pay off the loan. There's another important quantity here which is sort of hidden from the direct table, which is important to understand and appreciate. And that's the total amount of interest that you have paid through the life of your loan. That's easy to calculate. So for example, here, after 12 years, you've paid uh, 15 times 12 altogether. A hundred of that has gone towards the principal. You've got this left over. The remainder is how much has actually gone towards interest. And you can make the calculation. That turns out to be about $73. $73.08 is the total amount that you've spent just on interest to have this loan. That's the cost of the loan to you over the life of the loan. If you paid back $12 a year, then same kind of calculation shows that the interest is going to be $125.68. And with $11 regular deposit, the interest is $209.82. Now this is pretty relevant for a lot of people because these days people take out home loans for more than $100, but you could say multiply by a few uh, thousands to get in the right ballpark. And if you have a 30-year loan, that's pretty comparable to 26 years, so let's use this as a basis. This is sort of analogous to the way you might pay off a home loan it might take you 26 years. Most of the time your payments are just going to pay off interest, as you can see. And at the end of it, you initially borrowed 100 or maybe 100,000. And you have altogether paid $209.82 worth of interest. So to get that $100 loan, you have ultimately had to pay the $100 back, but also $200. That's the cost of the loan to you. This makes it clear why, you know, this, this big imbalance between being on the debt side of things and being on the credit side of things. This is why you want to be on the credit side of things. You do not want to be in debt because debt is expensive. Okay? Debt is expensive. All bankers know this. That's how we make our money. That's why we live in good style. Because the people who are owing us money are paying extra for this privilege. Sometimes quite a lot extra. Now let's talk about bonds. So bonds are the way institutions take out loans. Institutions, typically governments and companies, also have occasions where they want to borrow money. And the natural framework for doing that is, these days, through bonds. So debt taken on by institutions, which are talking about governments or companies, are usually these days in the form of bonds. And you can think of a bond as a physical certificate of indebtedness. A bond has um, clearly on it how much money is owed, what the interest rate is, and the date of maturity. So historically, governments issue bonds to raise money for, in my time, around 1890s that we we're talking about, typically for war or major projects. So a bond issue was something of an emergency situation where the government desperately needs money, either for war because you don't want to lose wars, that's very, very expensive, or for some major infrastructure project, okay? And 
bonds are how this is done. So companies, however, also issue bonds. Companies issue bonds to fund buying property or equipment for hiring, for research and development, and just to initiate new projects. So these are not to be argued with. I mean, these are, you know, valid reasons for wanting money and issuing bonds is an important way of generating that money. Historically, governments have a number of ways of trying to raise money. Of course, by increasing taxes, even though that's typically unpopular. Historically, invading another country and stealing their wealth is actually quite a cost-effective way of doing it. If you have a big army and you can do this, you can generate a lot of wealth this way. And you know, a lot of the great empires of uh, you know, history are basically built on this principle. Reprehensible, though we deem it now. Another very popular procedure is to debase currencies. We'll be talking about this more when we talk more about central banks and currencies in our next video. But, uh, you know, there's a mechanism that sovereigns have for extracting wealth indirectly from their citizenry by filling around with the currencies. Now, if we move to more modern times, say to medieval times, um, another possibility is to actually borrow from, from banks. In, say, the 1300s, uh, the banks were typically run by uh, Italian families. And, for example, Edward III of England, in the 1300s, to fund uh, some, some big war with France, he borrowed a lot of money from the Florentines. Uh, these were the banker, banking families in Florence. And, uh, and famously, however, he defaulted on his loans, which caused a huge uh, problem for the, for the Italian banks. So this does show, you know, that this possibility of default is never really too far away. There's always a possibility of default, especially when the monies involved become very big. Another way is to issue shares in public debt. Uh, this was done in, in Italy, in northern Italy, sort of around the from 1100s to the 1400s. Again, by the, the major cities at that time, uh, Genoa, uh, Venice, uh, Florence. Uh, maybe the first official bonds, in the sense that we know it, were issued by the city of Amsterdam, in the Dutch Republic, around 1517. They, uh, they issued bonds. And the first time that a, an actual national bank, the Bank of England, uh, raised bonds was in 1694. They had a war with France and they churned out uh, bonds to fund the war. And since that time, uh, it's become a very popular uh, method for governments. In the U.S., during the Revolutionary War, bonds were issued. In the Civil War, bonds were issued. So a lot of countries did this. In a time of emergency, you need to fight a war, you need money. You ask your citizens to lend you their money so that you can go off and fight the war and hopefully win. So around 1890, where I had served two terms as the governor of the Western Regional Reserve Bank, um, and my, my bank, the Western Cactus Bank, was, was going well. I had put Matt back in charge. He had moved back into big city. Uh, but governments were still getting into the habit of issuing bonds for various projects for creating infrastructure. And so the typical story was that there was a kind of a, a churn, a hierarchy of a flow of these bonds. So the government would issue bonds typically to the Reserve Bank, like the Western Regional Reserve Bank that I was a governor of. We would then pass that on to the commercial banks that were sort of under our wing. And then the commercial banks would sell those bonds to companies or individuals who had spare money. So then the money would flow back up here ultimately to the government. So the banks, of course, have an important role here to facilitate an orderly market for bonds. And at that time, 1890, I had no idea that this whole market would just grow so massively as it did in the 20th century. It was really one of the remarkable developments of 20th century finance. So around this time, a new opportunity came for me because the national government decided it was time to think about having a central bank, a central reserve bank. So they had had some efforts in this direction earlier, but they hadn't really amounted to much. And so 
they said, Norman, we want you to write us a report. How should we go about setting up a National Reserve Bank? So I spent a couple of years in Europe. I went to the major financial centers in Europe, which was the financial center of the world those days. I went to Holland. I went to Sweden to find out what they had done historically. And most importantly, I spent time in London, in, in, uh, in England, looking at what they did. So I'm going to report on that in my next video. Hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Bobberger. Thanks for listening.